Hey, this is Paul and it's dragon fruit season here and you can see how I like to root my cuttings during our dragon fruit growing season, during our summertime especially. So I have lots of different methods here and over the years we've tried different things. Sand, straight sand has worked really well. Straight pumice has worked really well. Our dragon fruit mixture has worked really well. But thanks to our friend Stefan Miller, he's recommended pure sunshine mix number four. I was using pumice 50% and sunshine mix, but now I'm using straight 100% sunshine mix number four, and I'm getting really vigorous root growth. Look at that. And this is just a little cotton candy that's probably been in here for about three weeks, four weeks. And look at that. So really great results, and I think a lot of it is mainly because sunshine mix number four, it cycles wet to dry really quickly and I think that has something to do with triggering the root development of these mystical plants. So straight 100% sunshine mix number four. Also it's really light. Feel how light that is Scott. Oh yeah that's surprisingly light. So we've done some videos about sunshine mix number four but as you can see it's not just in here we've expanded and now I'm doing all sorts of cuttings here. I have young, old, and some even with some rust and just really great results. You can see I'm watering them every other day. And young cuttings, I think there's a lot of growth hormones in them or something because they're rooting like insane. Also, look at our temperature here. We're ranging about 100 to 110. So you can see it's hot in here. I'm really hot. And what it is is the key is the UV. So dragon fruit can take a lot of high heat. They just don't like an intense UV, a high UV index. So this material here has been really helpful to blocking the UV, but yet maintaining a really high temperature. I mean, you can see I have another one of these too. And a lot of these are starting to root. You can see they're in sun most of the day and see how quickly they cycle dry. So. Sunshine mix number four has worked really well. Look at all the varieties, really rare things. Here's a Rick Rack. And I've must have what, three or four hundred cuttings here? Yeah, there's and a I've lot. I've had zero rot. I mean, we have another one over there we didn't show. So actually, two more. So zero rot, 100% success, just really easy. I'm planting them, or I've, I'm, I've set these to where they are north facing. So that way, none of the sun's coming in. I'm keeping them open because it's just getting so hot. I had them closed, it was 130 degrees in here. Oh and they started gosh. to yellow a little bit, Damn. but they didn't die. So uh, 100 to 110 degrees is optimal, believe it or not, really high temperature. So let me show you how I'm getting these rooted so successfully and so easily. So let's head down the hill and do the steps. Okay, here is the magic. This is sunshine mix number four. I find these at the big box stores. You can find it at hydroponic stores anywhere. Uh, some of the stores will sell the purple. I call this the purple bag. I also see black bags. I think it's a different brand. But same mixture. It's peat moss, perlite, and mycorrhizal fungi. And that is the magic. Really light and very soft and loamy. And I believe the roots can just spread really quickly. And again, that cycling wet to dry really quick is what we want. Also, it's really light. So it's so much lighter than mixing it with sand or pumice or any of those other heavier things that we could substrates. So how, how much is a that. bag of that? Um, it, it, it used to be like 20. It's gone up to like 30 to 40 bucks, I would say. Okay. But it's three cubic feet. And I can probably fill, I want to say about 50 to 60 one gallon pots like this. That's pretty good. Now another key uh, thing in my opinion is that if you like these one gallon nursery pots like I do, is I buy these at a hydroponic shop and they're 64 cents each plus tax and they're really thick and sturdy. Now you can also do a clear cup like a Starbucks cup if you're on a budget, but I really like one gallon pots because once I get them rooted in a one gallon pot, I feel that they're ready to start transitioning to more sunlight. So I like to get a nice root ball of about one gallon size for the root ball. So it's really simple. You just don't want to breathe it in, fill up your pot, and I'll show you the next step. Let's head up the hill. Okay, so I like to root my cuttings in the shade, as you can see. And a lot of these are younger cuttings, which some people, you definitely don't want to buy these. I don't recommend buying them, but I'm just going to root them here for myself. 
And what happens is, is I believe there's a lot of growth hormones in these plants and these younger cuttings, so they actually end up rooting pretty well. Now you could use nothing and just root them, but I like to use Vermisteras Vitality instead of a rooting hormone. Uh, Vermistera recommended that I try this, and I've been doing it for a few years now, and it's all I do now. So, I have a couple of pipes red here, Coco Iris, look at a really young cutting here. And normally I might sit them in this uh, mixture for anywhere from a few minutes to maybe half, overnight, I've done it overnight, it doesn't really matter. But I, I would probably generally leave them in here for at least five, ten minutes, and I'll come back. And then I like to plant them. Now, especially a young cutting like this, what I want to do is I want to break off the tip. So that way it will stop the growth and it will now send its energy backwards. And usually I notice it starts to root quicker. So I dip it in really well and then I just tie it up to a piece of bamboo that I collected from our yard. Now I usually use the clear tape, but I can't find any right now. I have this green tape. It's a little more firm. It's harder to remove. But you definitely just tie it up and then you're going to want to water it really well, which I'll show you how to do that in a few minutes. So I just repeat the process here. Young cuttings, old cuttings, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the variety you could see. Here's a polyrhizus. Here's a Guatemalan variety. Cetaceous, if they call that, you know, pink panther. So all different varieties. I do the same method and it's been working really, really well. So. You can see I've done it hundreds of times, maybe probably thousands. And as long as you don't plant them too deep, that would be my recommendation. A lot of people will plant them really deep. And as you can see, I do not. So what I do is I just set them in, I'd say about a half an inch. That's about all you need to go. I mean, do not do that. There's no need. A lot of people do that. I recommend again, just slightly. Okay, I've let these callus for about 24 to 48 hours. You could do it longer, up to a week. But not really, that's not needed. So now, you can keep them in indirect sunlight in the shade, but if you have a hot house, or a greenhouse, or even somewhere warm in your garage, or even in a windowsill that gets indirect light, just wanna put them in here. How much did you pay for these hot houses? Uh, I got these on Amazon for, I think they were 80 bucks. That's and then uh, they actually had different racks and you can see I didn't put the racks down low here. So I just doubled up the racks up top. They come with the racks? Yeah, they came with everything included here. They're about, I think $80, I wanna say $78. I'll put the link in so you could check them out if you want. Uh, they have windows, really easy to put together. And as you can see, I, I must have what, two, four, I probably have at least a hundred in each one. And I could probably squeeze in more if I wanted to. I mean, I use them for my seedlings. We, we have several of them and they've just worked out really well so far. Uh, it hasn't been too windy. That's the one thing I'm concerned about is having a really strong wind, but they've been great. Um, the one thing I need to do now is water them. So let me do that. Okay, the most critical step is now watering. So as you can see, I water the flesh of the plant and the sunshine mix number four, just lightly like that, that's it. And then I end up doing it every other day. So I watered a lot of these l last night. You can see they're still damp. And I probably could water them every day. I mean, it's just too excessive. But another thing is you're gonna see that I tend to get more sunlight on this side. So certain varieties I noticed of maybe I might see a slight yellowing. I'll put them down here, down low. And so down low tends to be a little less more sunlight. Look at that, we even have a flower bud in here off a of cutting. See? So they're really happy, really healthy. And again, this is really high heat. It's 100, 110 degrees in here consistently throughout the day. And these plants are just really happy. So sunshine mix number four and a nice Nice warm weather, and you're gonna have a lot of really happy, really healthy rooted dragon fruit plants for you to share and grow. So there you go, that's what I like to do this summer. I don't use any heating mats, I don't use anything else, but this is the method I've been using now for two years, and it's all I do. Hey, this is Paul, and today I'm gonna show you all the different types of potting soil, and we're gonna go from good to bad to horrible. So this is my personal growing mix. I do not expect people to use it. 
but it is pumice, a little bit of perlite number four, peat moss or sunshine mix four, coconut core, humic acid, what else, worm castings, and sand. So, it, uh, and I don't have exact ratios, it kind of just depends, but I use a lot of sand generally, but that's what's inside these pots. And look at our personal hybrids here, these uh, Maria Fusia seedling, really, really healthy. It's got growth already. Here's the Wallace Ranch Tribute. This is a seedling off of the Wall Wallace Ranch Hybrid. And everything's really happy, no stem rot. Now, if you don't wanna do all that because of the expense, well, we have some really easy, cheap growing medias as well with, we're being really successful with. And honestly, I think pure sand works absolutely great. So I top dress with Fox Farms now. So I only put Fox Farms on the top. And that sand has been awesome. This is 100% sand. I mean, it's got a little bit of pathogens here, but that's because we're getting so much shade here. But generally, you can see these plants are really happy and healthy. And I put them in here about eight months ago now. So they're really doing well. They rooted well. They're spreading their roots. But if you can't handle the weight of sand, because this pot is extremely heavy, 25 gallons of, or 20 gallon pot here with full sand is, I think it was 220 pounds, something like that, of sand. But if you want something lightweight, you could see I'm using, this is just sunshine, sunshine mix number four, which I really like, and a bunch of pumice. So those two ingredients for this potting soil. We've done a video on that before. But look at that, we even got this Diego's Desert King to shoot new growth in the winter and root. So it was in our hothouse, so look at that. So these are two great, cheaper ways to grow your dragon fruit in my experience, and I highly recommend both of these. So pure sand, or the really easy, thanks to Stefan Marshall. Uh, he introduced us to the Sunshine Mix number four and pumice like I described, and it's way light, it's much lighter. So let's go down the hill. I'm gonna show you the Vermistera sponsored pot. And what that one is, is, let's see, it's 50% uh, worm castings and 50% coconut core. And that one's all the way down here with some of our own personal hybrids. And that is here. Now, the drawback with it is it did compress over time, as you can see. So it used to be higher up in this pot. So it's gone down about a third. So after what I think it's been about two years now or so, maybe longer, and you can see it's, it's gone down. So I'm gonna have to top dress it and I'm gonna keep using the same materials just to see how it goes for long term. So again, this is 50% chunky coconut core, 50% worm castings, that's it. And the plants are healthy. They had a bit of rust here, but these are our own hybrids we're evaluating. This is an Asunta 2 seedling. And generally you can see the plants are really happy. Now I used uh, about a quarter of this mixture in this pot and then used the rest on, of my own mix. And that's working really well too. Now I do drill extra holes in these pots as well for added drainage, I think that's key. But generally you can see these plants are really happy and healthy. This is Gray Martin's Opal and it's acting like spring here already. So these growing medias, as you can see, these are all been replaced. They used to have fox farms and now they're all been replaced. They have zero fox farms in most of the yard. Uh, let's go up the hill now and I'll show you one that has some fox, far fox farms still and let's see if there's a difference in the plant health. All right, so here is Kaslau. Hopefully you saw our other video when we moved this plant from Danny's house. And this plant is too large. I, could, I tried to repot it this summer. I got a little bit of the fox farms out and it's on year two for this pot. And generally I think that this plant looks pretty healthy. It does have a little bit of sun damage. I did get a little bit of rot in different parts of the plant. I had to cut off a branch here. Got a little rot over here. But generally I would say at year two with amended fox farms, this plant, oh, there's some rot, is generally pretty healthy. I mean, I think it's, personally when there's compost in the soil, I feel like these plants are less sun tolerant and less cold tolerant in my humble opinion or well, What experience. is the soil mix on this one? Well, this one is amended fox farms. So I used back then that was pumice, perlite, vermiculite, fox farms for the majority of it and no sand back then. Mm. So uh, a lot of coconut core though, I did use that and worm casting. So generally this plant's pretty happy. You can see I, this is Maria Fusia that also had that old mixture and I was able to get about three quarters of it out of this pot and I repotted it in the fall. And look at it, it's really healthy and happy yeah, too. Yeah, it looks really healthy. It's got some damage though, but it's, it's putting out a bunch of buds, but you know, the buds that turn to branches. And I would say generally this plant feel, it's a little bit better overall health wise. And that's 
Still has half Fox Farms in this pot and half of our new mix, which is uh, the, the compost free. So I'm noticing generally that in my, I mean, just my hypothesis, I guess, again, is that I feel that when there's a lot of compost in the soil, after about year three to year four, these plants are just less tolerant of the extreme weather conditions. So with really healthy potting soil, with compost free potting soil, I should say, I'm just seeing a better overall health of the plant. So that's my experience in this part of the yard. We actually have some that are about four years in Fox Farm. So let's go check those out and see what they look like now. Okay, so this is another part of the yard where these have not received any grow power plus, but they've been in Fox Farm, amended Fox Farm potting soil for three and a half years. And look at the overall health of the plant. So I did fertilize last season and every year I fertilize, but the generally when the Fox Farm even amended, which has, what did I, what I put in here pumice, well, mostly Fox Farms, pumice, perlite, vermiculite back then. And so by year three and a half or year three, you can see there's just a lot of damage. The plants didn't grow very well. The drainage is poor. And if you watched our video where we interviewed Gary Matsuoka, he taught us that all these ground up dead trees in your potting soil are bad in the long term because they're gonna make the soil anaerobic and it will actually kill the roots and the drainage is poor as well. I think this one might be doing a little okay better because there's actually a hole in the side of the pot and there's added holes on the bottom, but still really slow growth. The color is much different than the other part of the yard. You can see they just get progressively worse. Here's another undatus, a lot of pathogens. It's really yellow, a totally different color. It's like lime green. And again, all these are in Fox farms. Here's one that's one, one even older and it climbed up this whole palm tree, as you can see. This is our little long-term experiment to just let it cruise up a palm tree. It's still never flowered. And you can see the plant health isn't that happy. I see fungus up there, I see pathogens, I see yellowing. And this one's even worse, look at this. So I'm really, my hypothesis is that, again, these, this is a sunnier part of the yard. So when these plants are in compost, they're gonna be less tolerant to cold and heat. They won't die. I mean, you can see how resilient these plants are, but man, this is not what you want. It's not healthy. This actually lost a lot of branches and I'm gonna move all these and repot them. You can see I have some control groups over here where these are our own hybrids and they're just in our pot personal potting soil mix I talked about in the beginning, but look at the difference. Same amount of sunlight, different color, lots of new growth. So I really believe that having really healthy potting soil, compost free potting soil, is the key to having really productive plants. So down here though, I will show you uh, another interesting thing is that dragon fruit plants that get a lot of shade, they do quite well with the Fox Farm potting soil or compost. You can see I have one over here that I've neglected. This whole section of the yard, sorry Scott, watch your head. But we grow a lot of plants here. And this one over here is actually really healthy. And it's in the same potting soil, but look at how little sun it gets. And it's never produced, it's climbing up this cypress tree. And it does have a lot of leaf litter from our bamboo. And the soil is really wet, but man, without a lot of sun, this plant looks pretty darn good, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks healthy. But this much shade, you're never gonna get fruit from a plant, it won't be very productive. So this thing's growing fine, but again, the key is I think here why this plant is healthy. It's not so much the soil, it's more about the lack of sun. And it has a little windbreak here. Maybe yeah, it is get a lot of protection. A little huh? more warmth maybe. Yeah, so we even have some more over here, I wanna see. And these ones has, have been a long-term experiment where I had them in Fox Farm still, which I will remove all of that this season and finish the job here. But these plants over here have always gotten about 40% sunlight. So not very much. And I just wanted to see what would happen if we neglect them and don't give them enough sunlight. And look at these, look at how little they've grown in three and a half years. Same potting soil, same amount of water, same fertilizer, but look at how the, there's a lack of growth. The color's different and they definitely need more sunlight as you can see. So I even put one here just to grow along this vine and I won't do that again. So I've really learned from this kind of control group as you can see. 
So believe it or not, look at this plant. Three and a half years it's been in here. So that's kind of my experience of different potting soil medias for now. Um, let's show you one more. I have one more down here that you won't believe. So let's go. It's one of my oldest plants. Okay, now this one is probably our saddest story. This plant is over four years old, believe it or not. It's one of our first plants, and I just stuck it in the ground here next to this rock. So I believe our native soil, a lot, with a combination, the soil gets really dense. It's, it's very heavy in DG, but I believe the combination of the heavy soil with a lot of shade and a cold rock, you can see it even rotted here, has led to horrible growth. I mean, look, this thing is four years old. It's literally like the fourth dragon fruit plant that I bought. Some no idea I got, I think it's a Home Depot or something, like fake Haley's Comet. So uh, as you can see, I think potting soil matters. I think growing in pots can be helpful for dragon fruit depending on your native soil unless you amend it. And I think sunshine is key. So personally, I really am on this improved potting soil mission because I really am noticing growth on using these compost-free potting soils and better long-term solutions. So there you go for what it's worth. That's my observations of using different soils and growing medias to experiment with. And as you can see, your potting soil matters from our experience. Hey, this is Paul and we get the question quite often, how much sun should I give my dragon fruit plant? And that's a really complex answer. In short, you can give it full sun like you see right here. Look at all the blooms. Now we do get a little bit of chlorosis here, that yellowing of the dragon fruit. And that's often variety dependent. Uh, this is a Guatemalan variety like American Beauty and the Guatemalensis tend to get a little bit of yellowing. But as you can see, that almost entices them to bloom. In other words, these plants like to get a little sun stress and that helps them want to bloom. So number one thing though, you can see how, much, how many varieties we grow in the full sun, but the number one thing you wanna talk about is your growing media. So you wanna grow in a compost-free potting soil. That is absolutely the most important thing in my opinion. Now, we used to have these pots full of fox farms. We were following those big YouTube videos and they recommended using fox farms. And within one year, I could tell that something was wrong. These plants were really yellow, especially during the winter. Uh, they were getting some rot here at the stem. These are some older plants here that have been repotted. But I was getting stem rot, having all sorts of problems. So number one thing is using a compost-free potting soil. You could use 100% sand. We, use, we have pots of just straight sand, top dressed, with a compost fertilizer. So compost is good when it's on the top, but in your potting soil, you're gonna get really big problems and that's gonna affect your sun tolerance in my experience. So now that we're compost free in our potting soil, you can see having just tons of blooms here, lots of flower buds, really, really healthy plants. Now, certain varieties do not do so well in the full sun. You can see we have some more Guatemalans here. This is Shana, again, some sun stress, but it's still flowering and fruiting. So this one I maybe would recommend maybe a 75% to 85% sun exposure. A little bit of shade in the afternoon would probably be perfect. But you can see this plant's thriving. It's really happy. It's got multiple flower buds in different waves. It's doing fine. That's just kind of an aspect of the variety. Now I would say this, these varieties tend to need a little shade in Southern California. This is a Pelora. So yellow Pelora. In fact, I actually have to graft it. They're grafted here and I grafted them because I was getting a lot of stem rot in the spring with this variety. So this variety you could see right here, it gets afternoon shade. The bamboo is giving it some nice filtered sunlight. Look at how happy and healthy it is. This variety does need a little less sun in my experience. If it's in full sun, it will yellow and lead to rot. Uh, this one is Country Roads. This one actually is cold sensitive. I would say it's more cold than, um, than heat sensitive. You can see it got some frost damage last season. But I thought I saw some flower buds on here, some new growth at least. So it's got something here. I, th I thought I saw a flower bud or two here somewhere. But uh, again, this one I noticed it does much better getting some shade in the afternoon. This Maria Fusia seems to like, again, about a 75 to 85% sun, and it's just starting to get some filtered sunlight. You can see how happy and healthy it is. Now, sometimes you can get too much shade. So we have some varieties here, like I had to prune off some more of this bamboo and this uh, jade red, 
and the Skeels Polyrhizus, they both, in my opinion, are getting a little bit too little sunlight. Uh, the, the branches are a little bit thin, a little bit atoliated. So my job is I'm gonna prune this out and get a little bit more sun. It's probably getting about 60% sunlight here, 65% in this spot. So this is what it looks like, in my opinion, when you need a little bit more sun. And over here, I've been actually pruning out this bamboo here for a while. Scott, you noticed that I've thinned it out, and that's because of this beautiful plant here. This is one of our unknowns from Elk Creek. I call this Elk Creek Unknown Number Two. And you can see it's just really, really green. I mean, it, in this much shade, you're gonna, if you want to grow cuttings, this is what you want to grow in. I mean, look at how healthy this plant is. But if you want flower and fruit, this needs more sunlight, a little bit more sun stress. So you can see I've removed some bamboo. I'm gonna do some more when I have some green waste trash cans available. But uh, this, these plants here are not getting enough sunlight. Same with this Desert King, the Diego's Desert King. It's, it, I've pruned it out, it's getting a, enough sunlight now to this is what I was hoping. See that right there, Scott? A little bit of chlorosis there, a little bit of yellowing. That means that this thing might flower soon. So in short, there is no really short answer about how much sunlight a dragon fruit plant can get, but it's more about how much sun they can tolerate. And they can tolerate a whole lot of sun if you have the right potting soil. If you're growing them in a nice developed rooting system, a big enough pot in other words, what you definitely don't want to do is take a new cutting and just stick it into your pot in this much sun. It's going to turn, get sunburned and it's going to die. So again, nice developed root zone and slowly introduce it to a lot of sun. Your plants are gonna be really happy and healthy like this one. Hey, this is Paul and right now it's May and look at this, we have our first official flower bud on Paul Thompson 7S. And when we get a flower bud, it's time to add a different fertilizer. So hopefully you've seen our last video about fertilizing in the spring. Now we're gonna move on to a late spring slash summer bud and bloom fertilizer. So let me go show you how I fertilize my dragon fruit. So now that the plants have recovered and we're gonna have a nice flowering and fruiting season, it's time to do a bud and bloom fertilizer. And what that means is it's gonna be lower in nitrogen, higher in uh, phosphorus and potassium. So we're using a 312-12. This is Grow Power's Flower and Bloom. We've also used and do recommend Dr. Earth Bud and Bloom. Hopefully you've seen our video here and it's been a great, uh, it works great as well but I think the Grow Power products are a little better. So what I like to do is I like to mix up some of this Fox Farm soil conditioner. And what this is, is mostly ground up dead trees. It's compost. It's actually 85 to 95% compost. It's got back guano. It's got some humic acid, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, some really good things. So I'm gonna mix this with the Bud and Bloom. So just do a few handfuls of this don't want to breathe it. And the reason why I'm using this instead of Ocean Forest, which I've used in the past, is that this is free of perlite. So it's mainly just compost, which is what Gary recommends to fertilize your plants anyways, and top dress. But you can see it's definitely really nice, rich organic matter. And then I'm gonna mix in some Bud and Bloom. Now sadly, this is really hard to find nowadays because Grow Power the owner sadly passed away, but you can still find it. And like I said, you could substitute this for Dr. Earth, Flower Girl, Bud and Bloom. They're both really good high quality products. So you can see, I'll mix it about, what's that, about 40% of the Bud and Bloom and about 60% of the compost. Now what I also do is I do like to add a little extra bone meal. This is takes time to it's kind of a slow re release. It takes time to break down, but that's gonna really help your plants as well. And then I also use some oyster shells, some added additional oyster shells. And what this is gonna do is it's been known to make your fruit's skin a little thicker. So you could also add more worm castings. You could use fish meal as well. This works pretty well, it does stink. So this is fish bone meal. Smells like the ocean. Then you mix it up really well. And so this is gonna make a really nice top dressing here for our dragon fruit that are mature 
and they're gonna flower this season. Now, I do not recommend using this on young plants. You're better off using like a grow power or something with higher nitrogen. Because you don't want those young plants to bloom, you actually want them to have a lot of growth the first season and then bloom after the next season or maybe into the third season. So there we go, it's mixed up pretty well. Let's take a look at it, that's what it looks like. And then it's really easy, you just top dress it, okay? Probably use about two or three handfuls per plant. This is Dark Star 9S, one of my favorite. It tastes like a kind of a grape pop flavor. And there we go. And then what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna water it in. So let me get some water and we'll finish this up. So just water it in really well. And again, top dress with compost. It works awesome, as you can see. And I expect that we're gonna have a really good fruiting season this year, especially on some of these more mature plants. This 9S Dark Star here, uh, we've had since 2019. So it's five years old now. And this Dark Star is really happy and healthy, vigorous grower, one of my favorite of Paul Thompson's hybrids. And now what I do recommend is you saw us apply this fertilizer, we're doing it early in May, and then we're gonna do it again in about six weeks. So about the mid-June, we're gonna reapply the same mixture of fertilizer, and that's gonna be it for the season. And then we're gonna fertilize in the fall to help the plants recover. Hey, this is Paul, and today we're gonna talk about fertilizing your dragon fruit in the spring. Now hopefully you saw what we did in the fall where we applied a nitrogen rich, rich uh, blood meal and a few other things. We top dressed in the fall to get our plants recovered after the season and you could see it paid off. They're really a nice dark green and then now that we have the plants what I call waking up where there's lots of varieties the majority of our plants are shooting out new growth as you can see. That's Laverne Pink. We have a hybrid here with new growth. Look at Paul Thompson's 7S. It's got some new growth here as you can see. And over here, this is Leo Jr. And look at all the new growth. So once I see several varieties, what I call waking up with all the new branches forming, I know it's time to do my spring fertilizing. And now I'm gonna try some, a few different things. We're gonna uh, use some bone meal and talk about the different ratios and what you wanna give and feed your dragon fruit now, this time of year. So let's go show you how we're gonna fertilize our plants this year. Let's go up the hill, check it out. Okay, so here are our three ingredients for our spring fertilizer routine. And the first most important ingredient is gonna be Grow Power Plus. Now, obviously, you may not be able to find this, so you can use humic acids, which they make granular humic acids work great. I highly recommend them. And then it also has a little bit 1% of soil penetrant, which is gypsum. Now, if you also don't, can't find this product, just make sure you get something at a good ratio like this that's nitrogen rich, 531. So a nitrogen rich fertilizer is gonna make your plants green and kind of help them recover even more. And then the second most ingredient, important ingredient is gonna be bone meal. And I really like that because it has phosphorus, which is gonna help your, feed your microbes. And it breaks down slowly because this is ground up animal bones, just to let you know. And then it also has calcium, which is really important for dragon fruit. They really like calcium and that's gonna help the cell wall structures and basically the cells function. So calcium is really a critical nutrient for your dragon fruit plants, especially this time of year. So those two, and then I'm gonna mix it up. I'll show you how in just a minute. And I'm gonna use Fox Farms Ocean Forest because this is basically like compost. Over 60% of it is ground up dead trees. It's got some good stuff like back guano, crab meal, shrimp meal, earthworm castings, and kelp meal. So all those ingredients will benefit your plant even more. And so now I'm gonna mix them up and I'll show you how I uh, top dress our dragon fruit and water it in. Okay, so the first thing I do is I dump about a third to a half of a bag of Fox Farms Ocean Forest. I've used Happy Frog as well. Both work pretty well. So I use that. And then I go to the Grow Power Plus, or you could use a similar all-purpose fertilizer. And I actually use six to seven handfuls. Don't breathe it. Usually I do a lucky number seven. There we go. 
Then, grab the bone meal. And what's good about this is this product breaks down really slowly, so it should stay in your potting soil or your soil for a while. I use about a third of a bag. Again, you don't want to breathe these products. Try to stay downwind. And then I just mix them up really well. And the last bag of Fox Farms was really wet from all the rain. So it didn't mix quite as well as this dry stuff. And the only bummer is that there's perlite in this, quite a bit of perlite. And so you'll have some floating perlite in your pot. But they use really small sized perlite. I like to use number four. So it is what it is, but also perlite's good because it's gonna add some nutrients and minerals to your soil over time as it breaks down. And it breaks down very slowly. So there you go, I mix it up just like so. And then here's dark star right here. You can see it's got lots of new growth. That's how I know I wanna give it some fertilizer. It's waking up. And you can see down here, it has tons of branches here forming. So I like to pop those off to really focus the growth at the top of the canopy. And then I'll just top dress it. Spread it around really well. Fox Farms is great for a top dressing. I think when we interviewed Gary, what did he say, Scott? He said it was the Cadillac of potting yeah. soil for the short term. Yeah, he, he recommended it as the best product for top dressing, I think. Yep. So top dress is uh, Gary's Best top, sop, top Pot. Basically, we, this is our own ratio, but it's similar to Gary's Best Top Pot. And you can see we top dress it with Fox Farms. Breaking off all these branches, and then I'm gonna go get my watering bucket and we'll water it in. Okay, so now I just give it a good watering in. Now, you can also let the rain water it in as well. And just get all those in nutrients into the soil. It's gonna feed your microbes really promote a good healthy plant for the spring so there you go it's as easy as that that's what i like to do for my spring fertilizer routine uh, give us a like and a subscribe and we'll show you how to apply a summer fertilizer in a few months to promote these to bud and bloom now as you can see we really focused on plant recovery last fall after visiting several dragon fruit farms and these are the darkest green most healthiest green our dragon fruit plants have ever been and I really think it has to do with the nitrogen and also using the gypsum like Dan recommended. So Scott's stepdad Dan recommended Grow Power Plus and that humic acid that gypsum has really led to some really healthy happy plants. I mean look at 5s beautiful green ready to go lots of new growth so I'm excited it's an early season this year last season we got a much later start so luckily the groundhog said it was gonna be an early spring and it's looking like it here in Southern California. Hey, this is Paul and today I'm gonna to show you how I do drip irrigation on our dragon fruit plants. As you can see here, I just fertilized and top dressed for spring and so now I turned on our drip irrigation and I use adjustable drippers so I can adjust the water flow in our pots. So let me go show you the steps on how we can make this happen for your dragon fruit at home. So let's go get started at the valve station. So the first thing you need to do is have your valves. So these are connected to our control center in the garage and nowadays you can actually buy ones that you can turn on and off with your smartphone. So I'd like to get that in the future. But the key is you have your valve set up and then you run your pipe, which we did here. It's all underground. And you can see I have it down here with the most important thing for your drip irrigation, which is gonna be right here, your pressure regulator. So what this does is it limits the PSI to, I believe, 35 pounds per square inch, and that way you won't blow your drip pipes. For, so from there, you're gonna run it on your half inch drip, as you can see here, and there's lots of different brands. All I can recommend is definitely stick with the same brand because sometimes like a Toro won't fit with a dig product. So after you run your pressure regulator and your drip piping, then you're gonna wanna come and start popping holes into your drip line as you can see here. So this is an old drip line, I'm gonna redo it. 
but you run your drip line, you wanna keep them at least 12 to 18 inches apart. And as you can see, I definitely recommend bearing them. And then I'll run the pipe, the drip line you can see here, is it will run it into the pot and I like to use 180 degree adjustable drippers. I get these at Home Depot and the adjustable drippers are key and I like the 180s because I could have it on the outside of the pot going in. And I also highly recommend drilling a hole in your pot so that way you can keep the line really close to your pot and definitely hopefully keep, if you're weed whacking or weeding, you'll keep everything intact and doesn't get destroyed. So from there, I like to run anywhere from one to two drippers per pot. I recommend two drippers on a 20 gallon pot. If you have something smaller, one dripper will do. And as you can see, like I said, I buried them and I have all of these on drip irrigation on a system. So each one of these long lines of dragon fruit here are on their own separate drip line. So you can see I stopped here, I buried it, I adjusted all these, and this is where I left off right here. So I put these metal stakes in and then I'm going to have to weed a little more and I'm going to add a nice layer of mulch here, which is optional. But I highly recommend bearing your drip because you're going to trip on it. If the weeds grow, it just makes a big mess and it's easy to get damaged. Once it's under the soil or under the uh, mulch in this case, it just, you forget about it. And so again, highly recommend using this. I water our, our plants about six months out of the year. So I haven't watered, turned on the drip since I think October. So it's been about six months since I've had to drip them. So now I'm gonna ch check the line and start getting on an irrigation schedule. Now these plants, as long as you use well-draining soil, and in my opinion, use compost-free potting soil, you could water these every day. So uh, Quang Ong, he said he used to grow his dragon fruit during the growing season. He would water them daily. And uh, I, I've honestly tried every other day with the drip irrigation for a shorter duration, and it really seemed to uh, be helpful for the plants. I don't get stem rot. You can see, look at the health of these plants. And so now this, we got out of our rainy season in Southern California, and you can see there's lots of new growth here. I'm gonna break those off, promote the canopy growth. And so drip irrigation is the way to go. These plants do like a lot of water. Remember, they're epiphytic cacti. So they're not a uh, arid cacti, they live in the tropics. So they like and can take a lot of water. So now that we're getting warmer, I'm gonna start watering them at least three times a week and keep the really healthy, happy growth. So recommend, like I said, using drip irrigation. Our plants have been enjoying it for a few years now and it's a great way to save water and time. The only thing is it, there's a cost to it. You know, drip irrigation parts are not cheap, especially when you have to buy as many as we do. So it adds up, but in the long run, it's the way to go. So I hope that helps you and you consider using some drip irrigation on your dragon fruit. Thanks for watching. Hey, this is Paul, and today I'm gonna to share with you the most cold sensitive varieties in our collection. Now we've been growing dragon fruit for over six seasons now. This is our sixth season and I'm, uh, it's changed a bit. But definitely this one in my book is now the most cold sensitive variety and this is Kathy Von Arum. I believe the Selenoceris uh, DNA in it, which is Stenopterus, leads to, is a cold sensitive variety and I think that translated into this plant. Now ironically, this has two other sisters. This is Kathy Von Arum and the other sisters are a bit more cold tolerant. Bruni in fact does quite well, but look at Kathy. So over the years, it doesn't get stem rot as you can see, Scott. It's not the base, it's not the potting soil. It's just the cold wind and maybe some of this spring sunny weather. But the combination, it tends to get rot just like this. It will yellow, lead to rot. And over the years, I have to say that every season, this happens to Kathy Von Arum. Now, believe it or not, it made beautiful fruit. We did a review on it last season. So it's gonna bounce back despite being down to the core. So I, I, I think it's the best tasting of the sisters, but it's definitely the most sensitive. Bruni's up the hill, that thing is beautiful. Doesn't get cold. Uh, it's very cold hardy, I would say. And here's another sister, Connie Meyer. And she's also pretty cold sensitive too. You could see that it had a little bit of damage. So that Stenopterus DNA also combined, I believe it's uh, an Andatus, has led to be rather cold resistant. But when Eckerd Meyer created this, he did it because he wanted a beautiful flower. He didn't grow it. He grew actually a, in a greenhouse in Germany. So I 
believe that these sisters, especially Kathy Von Arum, are their most cold sensitive varieties. Another one that's really cold sensitive that I'm surprised about is some of the Ocamponis varieties. So especially this one, Gray Panama did it as well, but the shorter spined uh, Ocamponis from Mexico tend to be more cold sensitive than I thought. I thought they would have been more cold tolerant because El Grullo and some of the other Ocamponis is a really cold tolerant and heat tolerant. But not in this case, look at the damage here. This has happened for two years now and that's all related to cold weather. And in fact, it actually got stem rot down here. So we've only had a few plants get stem rot now that we changed our potting soil to a compost free, but these really thick Ocamponis have gotten stem rot as you can see. Now even the uh, Ocamponis albino, the really beautiful yellow skinned uh, fruit that we did a review on, absolutely delicious, but look at how cold tolerant it is, cold sensitive it is. Look at this. So last year it rotted out here and then I've lost the canopy this winter. I had to prune it back. So some of the Ocamponis are just really, really cold sensitive. Up next, some of the Costa Recensis varieties. So over here I have San Ignacio and uh, polyrhizus can be cold sensitive too. We'll show that one in a minute. But Costa Recensis, like this San Ignacio, every season this happens. You can see they wake up later, but they're not as cold sensitive as people believe. They're gonna get damage here. They're gonna yellow. And these are just not very healthy. Look at this. And it's always this time of year, right? When they're coming out of dormancy. Now, believe it or not, this floppy looking piece is going to bounce back and thicken up. But you can see generally these are the least uh, healthy looking plants in the collection. So Costa Recensis, this is going to be uh, Caslau, Rosa, San Ignacio, uh, and more. So be careful with these. Now they do tend to bloom later as well, but this has happened several times. In fact, here's Danny's Pride of Fallbrook, which is one of those as well. And it's here. And it still is gonna get some of that modeling, as you can see, a little bit of rust. And so my experience of growing these for years now, I've noticed that just generally this happens this time of year. Now another cold sensitive variety, which I was shocked about, is the black dragon. So probably because of the Selenocerius DNA, the Coniflorus, crossed with Ocamponis, has led it to just be a little bit cold sensitive. It doesn't get damaged, but you can see it's just kind of ugly. And it will yellow despite the fertilizer and it just doesn't do as well, but then it's gonna be an early producer. You can see it's starting to turn red as it's waking up. And generally, I was shocked. I thought that this one would have been much more cold tolerant, but now we've been having, growing it for what, three, four years now, and every season it just kinda of looks kinda of bad up until about another few weeks when it starts to grow and bounce back. Now let's go up the hill. I wanna show you some more cold sensitive varieties. Okay, here's another cold sensitive variety in my opinion, and this is a polyrhizus. This is an unknown one from George Emmerich's collection, George Emmerich Jr.'s collection. You can see it's rotting here, it's yellowing, and granted it was in Fox Farms, I haven't repotted it yet, but generally the polyrhizus will do this, especially Orihona. I've had that one rot out several times, uh, Red Leonardo, and a few more. Now I've also noticed that these do a little bit better when they're in some shade. So over here, Scott, you can see, now I think there might be some rot on this one, let's go check, but Trinidad and a few others are in this location, you can see they get a lot more shade. So they're actually looking a lot better in this environment. But here's some rot, see? So Trinidad had a little bit of rot. There's uh, Red Leonardo. And just these polyrhizus tend to really have some sensitivity to cold weather, especially this time of year when we're transitioning from winter to spring. Now let me show you one more that's really cold sensitive. Okay, here's another cold sensitive variety in my opinion, and this is an Ecuador Pelora. Now I have a clone graft and a seedling graft, and that's the secret, is that I can only grow these in zone 9B, Southern California, when they're grafted. I've tried them ungrafted for years. It was one of the first varieties I tried to grow, and every year it would rot and turn really yellow at the stem. So you can see here there is a little bit of rust. I mean, actually this plant's waking up, which is surprising. So it does look pretty healthy. Again, it does have some cactus rust, but this is why, look at this, is I grafted them. 
So I'm using a Maria Fusia rootstock. So this is a seedling tip graft. You can see how thick it is. I grafted that several years ago. We got two fruit off of it and it bricked in the mid 20s. So really sweet. And what I liked about it is it was less earthy tasting than some of the store-bought fruit that you buy. Now this one is my favorite graft. Look at this, Scott. I'll come around here so you can see. But we had a fruit that bricked at 25 and I took the little tip and I clone grafted it off of the fruit. Now this one hasn't fruited yet. It's topped the canopy but it's been really slow to grow. So I would have to say that this one, you can only grow, at least in my climate, when it's grafted. And this is the best it's looked, probably because we're using a compost-free potting soil and we're using uh, Grow Power Plus with that humic acid and that gypsum. So there you go. There are some of the most cold-sensitive varieties in our collection, our ever-growing collection, and that's my experience as of now. Hey, this is Paul, and today we're gonna to talk about six varieties that produce flower buds early in the dragon fruit season. And the number one variety that everybody reports to be an early bloomer is 8S. And in this case, this is 8S Voodoo Child. You can see it has its first wave here. It does get a lot of sun here, the almost full sun, and that's gonna also be help get flower buds early. Now over here, we have another 8S, it's 8S Sugar Dragon, and it looks like it's producing its first flower bud here as well. So generally, 8S, Sugar Dragon, or Voodoo Child, they're excellent, they're self-fertile, they make a sweet, smaller sized fruit, and they're always a great pollen source, and they're early bloomers. Now this one's pretty rare, this is Paul Thompson 7S, and this is the sister seedling of Sugar Dragon, and you can see it's an early bloomer as well. But not really many people have it, however you can see this one technically bloomed before Sugar Dragon. So Paul Thompson 7S, the sister seedling to Sugar Dragon, is another early bloomer. All right, let me go show you one of my favorite ones to eat. Okay, this one's probably one of my favorite to eat. This is a Guatemalan variety, a Guatemalensis, and probably American Beauty. But this is an unidentified one. This is a no ID. But it consistently makes early flower buds, as you can see, one of the first bloomers. Magenta flesh, self fertile. So most Guatemalans, G1, G2, G3, American Beauty, Namibia Orange, even these no ID Guatemalans, they're gonna traditionally make a really early flower bud. And they're self fertile and a great pollen source. So this is another variety, a must grow variety, if you want early flowers and fruit. Okay, here's another consistent early bloomer. This is the Black Dragon. This is Slenoceris coniflorus crossed with Hylocerus ocamponis. Now, Black Africanus also blooms early, uh, but this one consistently an early bloomer, as you can see. Now, the problem with this one is that it's self-sterile, so you need to cross-pollinate. So you do not want to grow Black Dragon unless you have a Sugar Dragon or an 8S, a Voodoo Child, 7S, or American Beauty, because this one, it will not set fruit on it with its own pollen. But really stunning variety, tastes pretty good, the Black Dragon. Okay, here's another consistently early bloomer, and this is Bruni, or some people call it Bruni. Now, this is also self sterile You can see its first bud, flower bud here, and it's a really aggressive grower. It grows the best, and it's the cold hardiest of the three sisters, Connie Meyer, Kathy Von Arum, and Bruni. Now, this one will get some more flower buds with the heat wave, but it does get a little less sunlight here. If you can see, it's in the protection of this avocado tree. So, with a little bit of heat, and a little bit of more sun, this thing's gonna have a huge flush. And this makes a purple flower. But again, the problem with this one is that it's self-sterile. So you're gonna need one of the other varieties we showed you so you can cross-pollinate its flower to set the fruit. And the fruit tastes really sweet, kind of like a coconut flavor, really delicious. All right, and last but certainly not least, Robles Red. Now I don't have any flower buds on this. The plant's not that big. You can see it had a ton of buds though flower buds that turn to branches, as you can see here. But Robles Red is known to be self-fertile, and it's always one of the early bloomers. In fact, quite often, other growers report Robles Red to be the very first variety to bloom in their own farm. And it's also a great pollen source. So Robles Red is another variety that produces an early wave of flowers and fruit. Hey, this is Paul, and I'm here with Paco today, and we're gonna try out some desert weed. And tell us a little bit about the history of this plant, Paco. Desert weed is a seedling I grew from Desert King fruit that came into Huntington Beach in 2017. I was lucky enough to come across it. Then later I saved seeds because I realized I'd never be able to get cuttings probably. And just thought I'd experiment. And out of the different ones I have, this is the one that 
actually started developing later than the other ones, meaning I didn't have fruit on them until a year after the other ones. And then lo and behold, the fruit are bigger than the other ones. The plant is, is a little healthier. And since yeah, people huge. recently who saw posts I made are requesting cuttings, I thought people have to know like more about the fruit so they can decide whether they actually even want to grow this. So I figured what a great way to, you know, get some opinions is to have Paul try it and then later visit some other people down the road in a bit today. While I have all this fruit I can share. Yeah, and it's off season, so I mean it's I mean these are winter we would call these winter fruit, right? Yeah, you got some thorns on your finger there. Yeah, life happens. But I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a drawback about some of these is that they do get thorns, if, but you just brush them off, right, when they're ripe. Yeah, so one thing about seeing, like, dragon fruit on online in a group is people constantly think, or are typical for people to think, look, like, that must be the best one. I've got to have that one. And since people are buying it, I don't have the time to tell everyone who I, who I talk to, like, these are the drawbacks or these are the positives. Mm -hmm. The photos are obviously, like, positives. So I'm hoping that today I could share a little bit about what what people should know if they're going to grow something like this. It's an off-season fruit, like some other Desert King seedlings that are off-season fruit. What are some other positives besides the size? I mean, here's a Diego's Desert King, which is consistently smaller, at least in my experience, than these. So I see a larger size, a different shape. They're very elongated. Um, it's going to be probably a similar color flesh, I would assume, a magenta inside, dark magenta? It's actually a, a red color. Red color, okay, so it's more red than magenta. Where other related seedlings are magenta, like a bright, vibrant color, these are like, like red, like the polyrhizus style red. Okay, and you call it desert weed because it grows like a weed in your yard, right? You don't even fertilize it, you said? Yeah, I was going to call it weed whacker before because a, a family member hacked my first fruit with a <laughs> weed whacker because they couldn't see it, and then later... I figured if I can connect it to Desert King, people who don't get a chance to talk to me or see a video could relate it to Desert King. So I call it um, uh, Desert Weed after Desert King. Yeah, I like the name and it grows like a weed. It seems like the plant material is very vigorous from what I've seen. So as far as positives, it grows well. Mm -hmm. That's a positive. Uh, anybody who gets a lot of cold will see some damage on any plant they have. So this one can take some damage, but overall it does better than all the other Desert King seedlings I have. So that, and you grow wise. several, right? I've got several of those. And this one, in your opinion, grows the best out and of the seeds? It grows the best out of the others. Okay. And it's not too thorny. I mean, it's very similar. And these thorns on these hybrids, these Desert King seedlings, are actually spinier than you think. Like, I'll get stabbed by them, and they're a lot more stout. So uh, I did notice that, that that's a unique trait about these. What is uh, the negatives you were thinking about, some of the traits for this plant? I would say some of the negatives is... This one being self-sterile, if you haven't had the experience of how to save pollen, uh, you can get a lot of flowers, which this one does get plenty of flowers, but then if you can't set fruit because some, something happened to your pollen and it was, it was damaged in the freezer, um, you won't get the fruit. You'll be sad all winter wondering, why did, what did I do wrong? Uh -huh. And it could be maybe not knowing how to save pollen properly. Or, or having a late season bloom, maybe some sugar dragon might be able to bloom later in the season like that, so you could have some fresh pollen. Yeah. But you'd have to have different varieties. You couldn't just grow this alone. I'm lucky to have one variety that does flower late. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take as long as this one to develop. It's Edgar, not Edgar's baby. And that pollen alone will set fruit on this. Okay. Other things that have set fruit, some random ones from the neighborhood where I see flowers growing over backyards, I'll harvest that pollen for these flowers. And um, what's one? Oh, I have another related Desert King seedling where I just use its pollen on these flowers and it set fruit. And it sets fruit, okay. So it has that as a positive. That That's a good thing. It's not so picky. Yeah, some it, varieties can be really picky about their cross-pollination sources, right? Right. And then, but these are all consistently a very the same size, right? I mean, I don't see any small, you don't really see this on the desert weed, a smaller fruit? Or are they, am I right, or are they? That's like the outlier, the rare, it's rare to see It's rare small. to see it, so they're almost always this longer, larger size. They're about, what, a pound? Yes, the one you have, you're holding now is a pound, and this one's bigger than that one, so I think they're all in the one pound range, give or take. I left three on the vine, and two of those are smaller than all of these, just a little bit less spear-shaped uh -huh. and bulky. So uh, they, they were greener, so I didn't pick those and bring all of them. And they start to get a really nice darker color there. It's really pretty. 
So have you, you ever left them on the vine long enough to be solid? I did, solid red? I did last season, and that's when I had my best experience with this particular variety, where it had the flavors I liked in the other seedlings, meaning the acidity. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have expected that leaving it on longer would still have acidity based on what Ramiro Lobo had taught that, you know, you pick earlier to keep that acidity. If you wait too long, you get the sweetness and Just you lose the acidity. Uh -huh. uh, but, so it was still balanced. But this one still had some some balance in it. And they are on the vine at least half a year? Half a year. Okay. So about so, 180 days, 200 days, something yeah, like that? Yeah, from flower opening, you can bank on half a year here in Southern California. Okay. And do you think that they'll be able to have a shorter harvest time in the tropics? I think so. Yeah, I think, I think any, go heat, dormant. any heat plus you know, plenty of sun will help the plants not to go so dormant. Mm -hmm. I think I have a, uh, the side of the house where these are growing cast a shadow plus an avocado tree. So I don't know what's optimal yet for mm -hmm. these. So they, they get a part sun, the, the plant, the mother plant gets a part sun environment. It gets part sun environment. Okay. Well, let's cut one open. I want to try. Unless you have more background. So no, I'm I getting we excited. Start, <laughs> we start with this one that... Um, all right, how do you like to cut your fruit? This way, or I like to do them this way? Do you care? Like, you, right. like you do. All right. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. The now, seeds are a little bit bigger. I have never seen this magenta. Oh, really? So, so this is more magenta. Red. Well, what do you think the difference is? A pollen source or just the temperature, the climate? I have no clue. Huh. This, year, this year, I wasn't so careful with documenting what, what I put on each particular flower. Wow, but I'm excited pretty. to see that. Okay. So should, do you want to cut them, or should I bricks it first? Let's do that. Yeah, do the bricks. All right. Man, I'm excited. Look at how long that color is just really pretty. So it, traditionally, it's a redder fruit, you said. Yeah, let's, let's just grab a, a random one like this one to see if it's... Too bright. If it's redder. Okay. Uh, napkin. Like get one of your napkins? Of course. Perfect. That's actually good. So you can do that as you're bricksing. I'll, let's see. I'll cut this one up down the middle. Oh, actually, oh, it has thorns, so if you don't like thorns, the plus side is they come off quite easy. The downside is, you know, you can prick yourself. You just saw, whoops, you just saw Paul stick himself a few times and he didn't yeah, make too barely big of a fuss, feel it. but he's on video. 17 so. and 7 tenths. So definitely a nice level. I'm sure that they'll get sweeter. Let's see, I didn't want any seeds, I mean, the thorns end up on this thing. Can this one's a little redder. Yeah, it does look redder. And it could be that I'm indoors and my camera mm -hmm. looks redder. Yeah, we're in the full sun right now. But man, what a pretty color. All right, I'm ready to try some. So I'm gonna cut them up here. So Scott, you can try some. Now this one acts like Colombiana where you get the diuretic effect. So you do have to be careful. Like I'm gonna eat some more of these later. So it will clean you, you out. Me, if you don't see me eating too much now, it's because I know I'm going to be sampling some later. You got to pace yourself. <laughs> and I don't see any of the seeds have sprouted inside, which can happen sometimes on these fruit that have been on the vine for that long. Wow. I like it a lot. And this one was in the fridge, correct, for a while? Is this the one? For a couple, Yeah, for a couple weeks since I posted that first one that I cut. Wait, this fruit's been in the fridge for a few weeks? Actually, it was out wow. of the fridge for a week and a half. I just left it in the in the back room where it's kind of chilly. Then I noticed one of the sides was getting a little soft, so I thought, I, I need to put you in the fridge. Oh my gosh. This is great for being out off of the plant for so long. The seeds got it, a hint of spice. It does, it's not earthy. It's slightly more acidic than sweet I'm getting but in a very enjoyable way. Yeah, I like it. It reminds me of what I would, like if I imagine mixing a yellow Pelora with some American Beauty or a Guatemalensis, it, that's kind of the profiles I detect, the okay. tasting, which are both varieties I really like. This is that second one. I kind of just gonna sample one now while you're, really while you're sampling there. Feel free to hop I'd in I'd like on. to try one of these. Definitely a little darker, especially as the sun. We have some clouds now, and the flesh looks darker. So it is possibly the lighting. This supposed to be just a tad firmer. Just a, just a slight tad 
more wow. acidic, but in that same flavor range. That is so good. I really like this a lot. I can see why you want to share the desert weed. What I'm hoping for is that, like, try as many food as possible so that I can give people information about, you know, what might cause flavors to not be so good and mm -hmm. which ones, you know, you can bank on being worth sharing with family because, uh, you know, we want people who, who know that our hobbies take so much of our time and it's because of this, here, try this fruit. We want mm -hmm. them to go like, dude, that's pretty cool that you do that. Yeah, especially this time of year when, I mean, it's hard to get good fruit, especially in Southern California. Uh, this is a wonderful off-season fruit. I really, really like it. I, I actually prefer this one more than Diego's Desert King, personally, just because Diego's Desert King is a bit more sweet, at least in my experience, Interesting. and it doesn't have as much of the acidity. And I'm willing to bet, for anyone who has um, Diego, is that if you start experimenting with harvest time, you could find an optimal time where there's going to be times that it could be better than this one. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of Romero when they, he's always asked, like, hey, what's your favorite variety? He would tell people that the presentation is, well, this year it's this one. And that would confuse us. Like, what do you mean? Well, last year it was Armando. And uh. This year it's physical graffiti. Like some varieties outperform in one year mm -hmm. and then they have down years. Yeah. And it, it, do you think that. that's like a plant factor or a weather factor? Or we're not sure. A number of things that Ramiro wasn't able to fully like explain mm -hmm. because they had a regimen of, of fertilizing things that was kind of consistent because they're doing research. Mm -hmm. So it taught us to be like patient with the plants that we have in case we don't like something one year. Maybe it's just an off year. So. Oh man, I, what I like about it, it's really juicy. It's smooth. I get no, it's not grainy at all. Like it's, it's really, really good. Wow. Last year's ones were a darker red and the ones I left on, I, I noticed they were not as firm as this one. So I'm happy to find that these have the firmness. Yeah, because sometimes it'd be a little mushy. Like a mushier fruit, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah, prefer... I don't like that either. I, I prefer it like this. It's really firm. How many days uh, from the pollen set did you... September 28th are the photos of some of these right here. It was when the flower opened okay. and I pollinated. And it's what, April 5th today? Six, something like that? Yeah. Okay. So it was like six months. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> the, the flowering portion doesn't take as long. That's kind of like standard... The bud appears and maybe 30, 35 days later or less, you see the flower open. Mm -hmm. so that's not a long waiting time, but the rest, you just have to be patient. There's no other way around that. Yeah, you got to be patient. What, uh, how do you compare this one to the other seedlings you're evaluating, the sisters? I, I like the acidity in mm -hmm. the other ones that I'm finally start, starting to taste more of in this one compared to last year. So I like those other ones more because they're, they have more of the acidity pop. Okay. Mixed with the sweetness. Mm -hmm. They're higher bricks. Like that first one we tried, you mm -hmm. could tell the flavors weren't too strong sugar-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and there was acidity mixed into it, so that helped the flavor. Mm -hmm. So you'll, some of them were bricks in the 20s? I mean, anything above, personally, like 15, 16, I, I usually find a lot of enjoyable fruit any, anywhere. And then at the other end, once it hits the mid-20s, it's kind of too sweet, at least personally. So I think this is right in the nice range. Um, and a really well balanced. I also am noticing it's got a unique kind of like the little spots. You don't see that in some, at least I've never seen that. Like it, oh, like texture? Like marbling kind of. Like it's just different colors of red. It's really pretty. And so Desert King is a Colombiana cross with the Polyrhizus, correct? Yes. Okay. So that's where it gets the unique, and this is a much larger fruit than a Colombiana. So. Which was what Israel was after. Mm hmm. And there we have it. I'm lucky that. It, the plant does as well because a lot of people do like these fruit. Like, I've never tried a Diego's. Curious what that tastes like. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have to but try it. We'll compare them. Let's let's try try them together. We my could... gut tells me it's better than this one. Just really instinctively, yeah. Because uh -huh. I'm I'm seeing it, looking at it, like as if it was one of my own. Mm -hmm. And even though they're not that big, they're just like Jolly Ranchers almost. They can be. Yeah, I really liked it last season when we had a fruit about a year ago. I mean. They, they tend to be on the vine for six months, but to me, I like the texture. I, I really like this fruit, so we'll have to try them side by side. Maybe we'll do that today. So um, is there anything else you want to share about the desert weed that we missed? No, just be mindful that it, it, it takes like a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. People who know that we have this hobby know that we're out at night doing all this work, so you gotta be willing to um, save pollen, 
Um, and then, I don't know, just be patient. So be patient with the plant and then expect that it's not going to flower till the end of the season in Southern California? Right. The later time, time of year? So start planning in advance for who are your friends in your area that can help you with pollen. Mm -hmm. The fresher the pollen, the better. And do you ever use frozen pollen on this or do you keep it in the refrigerator? I have, but I've, I've mostly been able to rely on Edgar pollen because it's available. And, and it's fresh. Yeah. But one thing I noticed, this is something you can try out. I've had Edgar flowers that closed. I didn't harvest pollen from them because I knew others were coming on the way for new flowers of these. And so I'd, I'd dip into that old pollen from the day before. And on one occasion, it was two day old pollen, but the flower had already, already closed mm -hmm. and it still set fruit. Oh, so you were able to collect pollen after the flower had already bloomed and was closing up and it still worked. It I've did. never tried that. Okay, that's a good idea. And I, I remember hearing Gray Martin, you know, mentioning, you know, the importance of keeping your bag tight if you're testing something because two and three days later, pollen could still cross-contaminate something or whatever it is. There's, this pollen could last longer than, than we know. A lot longer than we think. It's just that moisture is an is a enemy mm -hmm. to this stuff. So if you're storing it in the freezer and you think you stored it right, you could have done the best you, you wanted to, but it only takes a little moisture to damage it. It could even just be a really humid day when you collect the moisture, uh, the pollen. Okay, so that's, that's you just gotta be really, you gotta plan ahead with this variety. Plan ahead mm -hmm. and be patient. Hopefully uh, you get this kind of fruit. Well, this has been a very enjoyable experience. So thank you for coming down and bringing them and letting us try it uh, today. And uh, I look forward to growing desert weed. I, I really like this fruit. I, it's, it was really balanced in my opinion. And, and for me to compare it to a, a Polora and an American Beauty, those are probably some of my favorite to eat. And to me, it just feels like those are mashed together in this fruit. Pick so. one to keep here when I'm gone. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. So uh, we appreciate it. Give us a like and a subscribe, and we'll keep them coming. Have a good day.